So what did uh, your first bottle of wine, what did you sell that for? <laughs> and what was it? Uh, well, this winery started in 1983 with uh, purchased fruit and the wine was actually made at another site. This building wasn't here yet. The winery wasn't built yet. And I was a sales representative for Oregon wineries at the time. I had a company called Cary Oregon Wines and we represented a number of Oregon wineries outside of the state of Oregon. Uh, David Adelsheim, Dick Erath, Bethel Heights, Yamhill Valley Vineyards, Ponzi, uh, and, and Hillcrest, and, and, and about ten others. And my job was to introduce their wines outside the state. So I'm the guy that took many of those wines to the East Coast for the first time and found distribution for them, and the Midwest, and in some cases California and Washington also. And this was one of the wineries that I represented. Uh, and their first wine was uh, among the most successful wines they've ever made. It was uh, Pinot Noir. The fruit came from Highland Vineyard, which is here in the McMinnville AVA. The wine was made at Sokol Blosser by Dennis Berger, who is one of the primary owners of Yamhill Valley Vineyards. And he was under the tutelage of um, Bob McRitchie, who was a winemaker at Sokol Blosser at the time. And this fruit came in, and Dennis, who had a full-time job teaching at OHSU, uh, came out and worked the night shift throughout harvest to uh -huh. learn how to make wine from Bob. And it just so happens that this, this fruit, uh, this wine that made the 1983 Yamhill Valley Pinot Noir, uh, was extraordinary. It was a very warm year, and uh, a lot of Oregon Pinot Noir was perhaps overripe that year. But Highland is a high altitude vineyard, relatively speaking, and the fruit was beautiful. So, being a little bit cooler because of the altitude and because of its placement here in the Minville AVA, uh, that wine uh, was just stunning. And in fact, a couple of years later, when I had gotten a belly full of people telling me that Oregon made pretty good wine, but it was about like good Beaujolais, um, I and and Myron and some other members of the trade here decided that actually we made wines a lot better than that. And in fact, we'd be willing to challenge Burgundy uh, to a tasting. Uh -huh. And we selected uh, the 1983 vintage because Burgundy told us it was a great vintage told the world it was a great vintage, and we knew we had a good vintage here, a very forward, rich vintage. So what happened was um, the Oregon Wine Board, or its equivalent at the time, hired the International Wine Center in New York to put on a comparative tasting, the Burgundy Oregon Challenge, if you will. And they were, uh, they were hired to do everything, so there was no bias. And every Oregon winery that made uh, Pinot Noir was uh, invited to enter into the lottery to see which ones would be tasted in New York. And the International Wine Center selected seven Burgundies from uh, Grand Cru to Commune wines. So it was a whole range of Burgundies. And they selected ten Oregon Pinots for this tasting. And then in September of 1985, the tasting was held at the International Wine Center, and the judges, which had been selected by the International Wine Center, were 25 New York, New Jersey area experts in Burgundy. There were a few experts in Oregon Pinot Noir at that time, but there were lots of people who thought they were experts in Burgundy. And they had 17 wines in front of a blind, and they were invited to, or they were asked to do two things. One was Give us the origin of every wine. You got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> and two, name your three favorites out of the 17. And I figured that this would be a great marketing deal because <clears throat> our average price at that time was about $11 on the shelf. Wow. And the Burgundies were about $29, $27, $29. And I figured we'd fall in the middle the Grand Cru's would beat us, and maybe some of the Premier Cru's would beat us, but we would fall in the middle and we'd look like great value. 
Oregon got first, second, third, and fourth, and tied for fifth. Isn't that something? Yeah. And Yamhill Valley was number one. Is that right? That very first wine that they ever made here was the the top choice, wow. and it sold for twelve dollars. Now, so at that time, though, you were working in the distribution. I was a marketing agent yeah. for Oregon Wines. I was, and this was just one of my uh, clients. Yeah. I came here. My partner and I decided uh, to and close. Your partner's name. My partner was uh, Reuben Rich in Cary, Oregon Wines. We decided to shut the business down in '90. We were tired of the rejection rejection we were getting, and it was really tough sledding out there, trying to T tough in what way? Oh, people just said, "Where's Oregon?" Yeah. I, we don't need no stinking Pinot Noir. We don't. What's Oregon? I mean, you're not even California. Get out of here. And yeah, they're okay. You know, you guys keep trying. You'll make good Beaujolais someday. And there was just a lot of that, so it was really hard to make a dime. It was hard to break even. And so and you're marketing like on the other coast then? Yeah, or? primarily on the East Coast. In New but York we and did the United States uh -huh. and some international, uh -huh. um, some European and some Canadian. Uh, and it was, like I say, it was tough going. What was the? the I'm kind of curious, and I've not heard. What What was the European reaction? Oh, it was uh, novelty in those days. I mean, novelty in terms of a, a positive uh, thing. Hey, let's try this. Or were they set in their ways and? You know, Burgundy's over here, and that's it. There was a, at the level of the most curious and best merchant, there was some curiosity. Uh, there was some appreciation for the wines. There was certainly appreciation for the wines. They were they were seen to be good wines. Uh -huh. David Lett had already scored extremely highly in the Gomio tasting and the reproduction of that in Burgundy uh, in 79, I believe, 70. And then the New York thing had, the the New York thing had lit the fire. It was the, those two events were the single most important marketing events in the early years of, yeah. of Oregon Pinot Noir, of Oregon wine. But there, I mean, it was, a, you know, it was a, it was more of a novelty issue in, in Europe. We sold a little bit of wine in uh, England and Ireland, and we visited the Scandinavian countries. We never made a real effort in. Burgundy or in Paris, uh, we did a joint tasting. No, not a joint tasting. We did a Oregon Pinot Noir tasting at a chateau in Burgundy. Really? That was attended by <laughs> Burgundy winemakers. Well, how was that? That was great. They they were very appreciative and they, they were very very gracious. Now, the Burgundians have have been very good to us. They have shared a great deal of information with us. And it's one of the reasons why we've never replicated that, um, that challenge, because we don't feel that we're really in competition with Burgundy. We're in competition with Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Zinfandel and Pepsi-Cola. You know, my job isn't being better than Burgundy. We're different. We don't make the same wine. Our job is to get people to drink Pinot Noir, any kind. And they have been very helpful in things like well, teaching us uh, trellising. And you see all over the state now the vertical shoot positioning trellising, VSP trellising. And that's a direct offshoot from uh, visits to Burgundy to see how to maximize solar radiation. When you, when you make wine in a cool climate, you, you need to maximize every bit of sunlight that you can. You have to capture as much energy as you can. And that trellis does that better than the California sprawl, which we started with here. California sprawl, that's great. And a single wire, high wire cordon, often known as the California sprawl. Uh, Looks like the beetles are out there growing. I used to pick grapes in 67, 68, and 69 in mm -hmm. Napa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you're looking even at head. Yep trained vines there, Napa and Sonoma, still working with head trained vines, particularly with the Zinfandel and some very old Henry Cabernet. Zin, yeah. 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 So, um, at this time, it's like you're still thinking marketing, and then you came back from New York, 
what was what were your feelings? I mean, what, what what are your thoughts and what are your feelings after you know coming in first, second, third, fourth, and tied for fifth? Well, there are a couple of sidebars to this that are sort of worth knowing. Um, this is when we learned that the Wine Spectator, the most important publication in our business, had a very strong bias toward California. And the reason I know that is because when Stephen Spurrier did his famous comparative tasting of California Cabernet and Bordeaux in Paris in 78, I think, um, one Cabernet topped the list, and then there were a number of Bordeaux, and then some more California Cabernets came after that. But the headline on the front page of the Wine Spectator was California Bess Bordeaux in Cabernet tasting. When the Wine Spectator reported on the New York Oregon Burgundy challenge, it was on page six, and the banner was Burgundy's Fizzle Again in New York. <laughs> fizzle Again? Burgundy's Fizzle Again in New York. Wow. I still have that clipping. So that's when we realized that you know we not only had to contend with Cabernet and Merlot and whatever other red wine, we also had to contend with California or with the wine spectator at least. Like the prejudice. Yeah. yeah. And house palate or regional palate, whatever you want to call it, but there's also it just wasn't California. We didn't have the money to do a lot of advertising. I mean, there was just a whole lot of reasons why we were not taken very seriously. After that tasting, we were taken a great deal more seriously. By? By the, uh, the distributor and the nut-crazy consumer who was you know, looking to know about the latest and greatest, the most eager, avid, wine student, if you will. Uh -huh. And it had a huge impact at home. Here, in Oregon? And we were, Oregon wines were, had a tough time starting here. They, there were, weren't very many of us, there weren't very many producers, and we didn't make a whole lot of wine. And because we were local, we were treated like local yokels. You know, these, these are fine, but man, have you tasted a good Burgundy or a good Napa Cabernet? I mean, they're, these are really good wines. You guys, well, after New York, all of a sudden, there was a huge amount of pride locally about Oregon Pinot Noir. You see what we did? We whooped those Burgundians. I mean, look at these. These, these are great wines. And in one, in one minute there, between David Lett's tasting or the Irie tasting and this thing, there was just a whole huge amount of respect gained right here at home. And Portland finally started taking pride in Oregon wines. It, it had a huge impact in the local market. So now what did you do? You know, like you're still, you know, being like the salesperson. I mean, this changes your whole, <laughs> it seems like it changes your whole modus operandi here. Uh, what I did was try to keep the distributor, the producers from all raising their prices too much <laughs> <laughs> and killing the goose before it's well established. Uh, at which we had some success, but uh, what we did was just sold more wine and it was easier to sell more wine. So we were starting to get to the point where we could maybe call it a real business. And that's selling it locally and... Well, we didn't have anything to do with selling it locally. Uh, we, we did, okay. not, we did okay. not distribute in Oregon. Oh, okay. Because the producers here had distributors, you know, people like Henny Hinsdale and Howard and Karen Hinsdale in Salem, where I worked before I started Cary Oregon Wines, they were doing a fine job here in Oregon. So most of these guys, the producers didn't need me to help out uh -huh. here. This market was doing well. What Howard and Karen built was, you know, and Greg Lemma to some degree also in Portland, they they both were building Oregon brands rapidly and doing a good job of it, an, a, an excellent job. So what what made you think about, or what was the motivation to sell Oregon wines outside of Oregon? And where, did, where did that idea come from? 
well, just a great passion and belief that this was a great place for Pinot Noir and that these were wonderful, wonderful wines. Um, I cut my teeth in this business learning Burgundy and Bordeaux before California and Oregon were well established. And once Oregon got going, I realized that these are just fabulous wines. I'm a native Oregonian. We have 375 winemakers now in Oregon, and I think I'm one of about 12 native sons. So I've got you know, a tremendous amount of pride in my home state and the fact that we can make this kind of wine. In my mind, was world class. Kind of, uh, you know, maybe it's better for me to kind of step back a little bit and ask you kind of for a, a two-minute uh, uh, version of what Siren called you to, you know, to the winemaking thing, all the way up to, to now, because like you made then, you know, you quit the the, the sales part, and now you're actually a, a winemaker. I've, I've gone backwards in this business. Most people <laughs> start out in wine production and end up somewhere in marketing or sales. Or, and I went backwards because I found out that I really enjoyed making wine. Uh -huh. That's It's the most gratifying part of this business, and I've done it all. Uh, selling it's fun, and I started out as a sommelier. I was. Oh, where was that? Uh, Sun River. In Sun River? I was the first sommelier at Sun River, first wine steward at Sun River. So where did you get the, the, the knowledge then? I mean, you must have... I, um, I served as, as an officer in the U.S. Navy navigating airplanes during the Vietnam era. And when I got out, I realized that I didn't want a 9-to-5 job. And my training was in radio and television news and special events. Uh -huh. And uh, radio and television stations in Portland had no need for me. They were being hounded by very experienced people from all over the country who wanted to move to Portland. So they because didn't of the lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. And so I couldn't find a job in a television station and didn't have much interest in uh, deadline news anyway. The only thing of interest to me would have been documentary work or long-term project kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And I, that just wasn't going to work out. And I was starving to death as a freelance photographer and writer. Ah. And my friends, Howard and Karen Hinsdale, had bought into a wine distribution company. Uh -huh. So I spent a lot of time at their place and staying with them and drinking their cellar, their, all the wines that they sold. I got to know them all, just out of curiosity. And this job came up where Sun River wanted a full-time wine steward. And they said, well, why don't you go over and apply for that? It didn't seem like a you know, much of a career move for a college graduate and a naval officer, but what the heck. Uh -huh. So I went and I did it, and it was it was terrific. I mean, I I lived in a tent, but on uh, the property there. So. Yeah, nearby and uh -huh. across the river, and uh, I ate off the menu with the chef every night and drank out of the cellar. I worked about four or five hours a day and made lots of money and. The waitresses treated me well, and so I thought, this is a pretty good life. Uh -huh. And I've been in the wine business in one way or another ever since. I did that for about three years at various places in California and Colorado. And then I came back here and, and went to work in, in wholesale, did that for eight years, and then the marketing... Oh, so that was when you started your... No, that's no. when I worked for Howard and Karen in oh, Salem okay. for the Oregon Distribution Company. And then I did my own business for about eight years. And then the rejection and the travel were killing me. It was, like I say, it was tough to make a dime, and it was, so we, uh, we did things like, well, my last sales trip, I stayed out 10 weeks without ever coming home just to keep expenses down. And that was getting real old, and I didn't have a life, so I decided I was going to get out of it. And these guys here at Yamhill Valley, David and Dennis, who were both full-time PhD microbiologist professionals, they were trying to run the business on their own. They realized that they, after eight years of doing it themselves, that they had a property that deserved a full-time winemaker. So they said, well, we'll teach you how to be a winemaker if you'll uh, help us with marketing. Huh. And I've been here ever since. So it's kind of a trade-off then. Well, it, it was. It turns out that I started making wine in 83 and 
when I was at Henny Hinsdale, some fellow workers and I decided we wanted to make a barrel or two of Pinot Noir. So uh -huh. we, we started making Pinot Noir. As Sourcing the fruit from? Well, we represented Dick Erath and Bethel Heights and Ponzi, so we got grapes from uh, from here, from Bethel Heights, from Erath. We got, wow. and our mentors were the best winemakers in the state. So they taught me how to make wine. I learned from from those guys. We were selling their wines, so they were inclined to sell us a ton of fruit and have at it. Uh -huh. And we got pretty serious. We had four French oak barrels in my basement, you know, and I'm consulting with these guys, you know, what do I do, what do I do? So I learned. By the time I got here, I, I had been making wine for eight years already, uh -huh. and I'd done a harvest in New Zealand and a harvest in Australia. So after the first couple of weeks here in 91, Dennis Berger had been the winemaker, and he just turned to me and said, well, Stephen, you already know how to make wine. You just don't know how to run the press. And so here's how you run the press. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> and that was 17 years ago. Uh -huh. so, yeah. so let's see, what year? That was uh, 1980 then. 91. Not 91. Oh, that's right. My first vintage year was 91. 91. I finished the 90s and, and made the 91s. Uh -huh. And so in uh, 91... And so what, what, what was the fruit on that? That was a Pinot and what were you making? Oh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Riesling. Uh -huh. And we actually had some, we had a few rows of Mueller Turgau and we had a couple of, we had a row of Cabernet Sauvignon, which was, Dennis loves Cabernet and so he thought we could. When, we, when they oh, first wow. planted this place in 83, they had a master plan that was uh, purely pipe dreaming. It had things like Zinfandel in it and Zinfandel. Cabernet and you know all these varieties that they just like to drink. So why don't we plant them? And you know without m much consideration for temperature or anything else. Fortunately, those plans got modified long before grapes went into the ground, with the exception of uh, a couple of acres of Miller Turgau and, and uh, in a row in two rows of Cabernet. We pulled the Cabernet out a few years later after one successful harvest in ten years. You got one harvest out. Yeah, we got one. It got ripe in uh, eighty-five. 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 It got ripe. Would you use hair blowers or something on them, or <laughs> <laughs> no? It was uh, nice and warm. Eighty-five. Was plenty of sunshine. Uh, but we realized that that wasn't going to happen very often, so out they came. Yeah, we actually left them in for another couple of years, and just didn't pick them because they were a little defense against the birds eating all of the Pinot Gris that was right next to them. Ah, they were closer to the trees, so oh, I see. So the, the birds would hit the Cabernet before they went for the Pinot Gris. Yeah, but, huh. and even though it wasn't quite ripe, I mean, it wasn't uh, as birds. You know, they're, they're not it was ripe enough. Yeah. yeah, they're not out there tasting, looking for 24 <laughs> versus 22. They're not that discriminating. Starlings are good, but they're not that good. Yeah. So, um, in in all this history, what would you say for you personally was like a like the like a high moment? Something that maybe you tried to do that uh, just really worked. That was may or maybe an aha kind of a moment that oh wow, look at this! This really worked. Uh, there's a number of those here, and I say that looking back, and what's really happened is I've come to the realization that terroir is everything in Pinot Noir. It's really important, and the terroir here is different from any place I've ever been. And that includes five miles across the valley in the Eola Hills or the Amity Hills, or ten miles away in Dundee. Those soils are different, and the grape Pinot Noir we're talking about now grows differently there than it does here. And at some point, I kept wondering why our wines were so different from the wines from those places. Mm -hmm. 
I kept tasting them. I knew I was making them in basically the same fashion. There was very little difference in production. And I knew that I was picking them uh, based on the same kind of ripening characteristics that my friends use and did use then. And then it finally dawned on me that it's got to be in the ground here. There has to be a difference perhaps in the temperature or rainfall or whatever, but there certainly had to be a difference in the ground. Mm -hmm. You could not explain it all through clone or trellising or viticultural practices. So I started trying to figure out more about what the soil makeup is here. And after years of um, delving into it, it's now pretty obvious to me that we're on very different soil types. These are primarily marine sedimentary soils here. There's very little volcanic intrusion on this property. <clears throat> and my friends and a number of friends in Burgundy have told me that sedimentary soils mean more clay, and more clay means more weight, more tannin, more structure, more intensity, more phenolics of all kinds. And that's exactly what we have here. We get, I mean, this is God's own sink for tannin in Pinot Noir. And that's unheard of in the, in the world of Pinot Noir. And I, th I think my greatest discovery is paying attention to the property that I live on, listening to what this place is trying to tell me. What, this is what it's going to make. Listen up. I think that young winemakers often um, come to a property with the idea that this is the style that they're going to uh, force on their fruit. And the reality in Pinot Noir is, in my mind, that you get the most successful wines when you turn it around and you do the listening and you let the place uh, describe what, what it wants to make. And that's, that's my greatest discovery here. That's, what I've, that's my greatest contribution to Yamhill Valley Vineyards and maybe to all Pinot Noir understanding uh, in Oregon. Is that you, the more you pay attention to your place, the more successful you're going to be. And there has been no substitute for these 20 plus years of working with fruit from this one site. I know those guys now. I know what they're trying to tell me. And we have, we have made better and better wines because vines have gotten older and they're more mature. That's certainly a big part of it. But the winemaker's gotten older too. And he's learned something. How is the soil different than, say, the, you know, like in Carleton? Well, there's certainly marine sedimentary influence there, too, but I, as I read the AVA maps and the, the information that's available, I think there is still uh, less clay and that they are not, that they are more mixed between marine sedimentary and volcanic than we are here. I mean, we're, we're supposed to have, according to the soils maps, the USGS, we're supposed to have volcanic underlay over most of this property. And it's supposed to be anywhere from 4 to 20 feet down. You should be running into basalt, solid, fractured above that, and solid basalt below that. And we drilled three wells here in, in the last 10 years looking for water. And the last one went 280 feet, and it, it never touched anything basalt, anything volcanic. All marine sedimentary. I, I always thought, and again, I'm like I'm a total novice in all this kind of stuff. But I always thought that you know, like these hills and stuff were like that plate, you know, that's being subducted under the what is it, the American or whatever the, the North plate. American. And so then, then these hills are just kind of basically scraped up, and that's where the sediment. You know, comes from, and maybe True. like the soils here are, you know, like that particular part of the ocean bottom had, I don't know, whales poop there more often or something. I don't know. No, no, no. It's uh, we know even more about it than that. When when soils are created in deep water, 
there is very little or no organic material involved because the middle of the ocean has very little organic material. Organic soils or organic sedimentary soils are indications of shallow water, shallow seas. So there are places in this valley where if you dig down, you're going to hit uh, sedimentary soils with lots of mollusk and other shells and indications of life forms. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that was formed in the Willamette Valley when it was an ocean, when it was a shallow sea. Uh -huh. These Coast Range Mountains came from the Mid-Pacific Rift. They were created a long time ago in the center of, the, of our ocean where it's, where it's upwelling. This plate is moving, uh, that ocean plate out there is moving eastward, and the North American continent is moving, plate is moving westward, and as they collide, the, the continent, the North American plate, is lighter, so it rides up, and the ocean plate is heavier, huh. so it's forced down, uh -huh. and what's happened is as it goes down, the top of it crumples like that, uh -huh. like a sheet, where you, you're trying to shove the sheet down, you know, and it won't, it won't go, most of it goes, but the top of it gets scraped off, and that's what these, these hills are, they're the bottom of the ocean in the middle of the Pacific a long time ago. There's, yeah. there's not much, uh, there only in a few places are there indications of shallow water sedimentation. Hmm. That way a few miles, there's plenty of it. But here in the range, ah. there isn't. So like this area right in here is from a, a deeper pocket then? It came from the middle of the ocean. Huh. Came, it was, this, these soils amazing. were formed at very, in, in very deep water. And as they move, you know, westward, eastward, uh, they eventually got to the point where they were starting to collect some organic material, but not a lot. It's also the, the coast range is is pretty bloody complex because, in addition to this intersection of those plates, there's another place to the south that's pushing in, so it's a triangle effect uh, that has an effect further south of here, not so much right here. But you also have then intrusions of volcanic material, uh, but not right here. Hmm. In the McMinnville AVA, which is pretty big, um, there are definitely intrusions of volcanic material. And many of my fellow growers here um, either have volcanic soils or believe they have volcanic soils because we know that there are intrusions in this McMinnville AVA. There are volcanic intrusions. But I can't find any on this property. And now I've, I've had several geologists uh, tell me that, in fact, this is all marine sedimentary stuff. Now, I have another geologist that tells me, no, some of this is volcanic. So, but all I can do is go back to the wines. I know that we have the same clone as the most common clone in Oregon, the Pomard clone. I know that I've got Dijon clones, and I know that the wines that are produced here are being produced in extremely gentle fashion, and they're different from Dundee Hills or Eola Hills wines. Huh. And how I are they have different? to go back. There's, more in, there's just more intensity there. More the intensity in terms of? Tannin, uh, structure, acid, uh, phenolic pigment. Huh. These wines are black a day into fermentation. Huh. And again, atypical for Pinot Noir. But somewhat typical for McMinnville AVA. We were the only winery here for about 16 years. There were a few other vineyards, but we were the second vineyard in this AVA and the first winery and there wasn't another winery here for a long time. Uh -huh. So I couldn't compare this site with other sites from around me. Well, now I have company. Now we've got Mo and Coleman and, you know, Coutetier and some, some other terrific winemakers here in the district. And I'm seeing a lot of similarities. Huh. 
Their vines aren't as old as ours, but their wines already show this structure thing. And when we get together as a group and talk about the difference between our wines and the other districts right around us, we come up with the same descriptions. More intensity, more phenolic, more color, more tannin, more acid. Structure. Yeah. Um, years ago, Gerald Asher said that we make the, I make the best Syrah in the state of Oregon. And we don't have any straw on the property. <laughs> but that's how heavy the wines were, particularly back then, before huh. I became more gentle. Uh, yeah, they're really rich, strong, and tannic Pinot Noir. Yeah. And they were halfway to people thinking they were another variety. Now, all the other wi uh, winemakers that, that are in this group that have similar kind of characteristics, are they all on this kind of this side of... Uh, you know, it's like you're kind of sheltered here, you know, uh, against the. Uh... Yes, but the McMinnville AVA is uh, encompasses areas that are not as sheltered. Yeah. So. Um, and we range all over the board within this AVA, and there are people over the hill from me who have are still well protected. They're still in a good rain shadow of the uh, of the coast range. Um, there are others that are high altitude, much higher altitude, up over a thousand feet or close to it, and basically exposed to the west. And the climate there is different from in, from here. Uh -huh. So, you know, the the AVA is is always going to have quite a bit of range in the wines that come out of it. Ooh, this, these are not, you know, an AVA in Burgundy might be a couple hundred acres. This is thousands and thousands of acres, yeah. and it encompasses an area about well, a quarter the size of Burgundy. One AVA, yeah. so of course it's going to it's going to it is not a harmonious place. There may be a lot of commonality, but there's also going to be some real different spots within the AVA. Yeah. What about for you personally? You know, you talked about things that that were a success for you, that you felt really good about. What about, you know, something come to mind that was just a kind of an, oh, I wish that hadn't happened, or you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, you know, you were trying something and it just didn't work, or, you know, in farming, farmers make a lot of mistakes over the years, but, you know, that's part of the learning process. Yeah, we've certainly had our disappointments here. I, um, I had a stuck Chardonnay. A stuck Chardonnay, what do we mean? And fermentation didn't complete. Huh. And um, the advice I got from some experienced winemakers was just don't worry about it, leave it alone. In the springtime, it'll come back to life and finish fermentation. And all that it did was grow a whole bunch of really ugly, nasty microbes that ruined it. <laughs> so <laughs> I cost us a tank of, of Chardonnay that I consider a disappointment. I should have been. Uh, more critical, I should have, I should have uh, tried harder to get that fermentation started again. I, I did what I was supposed to do, but it didn't work, and I, I should have kept trying. I should have found a way to get it warmer or something, and, and help it go again. And I didn't, so I'm, I'm not happy about that one. I had a bottling problem that, uh, that led to some spoiled wines, and I regret that. But, um, these things happen, you know. It's we've been here 20 years. We haven't, we've never had a serious injury, we've, which I consider to be uh, extremely important. Safety first. We've never had a uh, a life-threatening in injury. We've had very few injuries at all. So uh, overall, and the wines have gained more and more respect as the years have gone by. I, I'm glad that that wasn't easy also. I'm glad that it took us a, a while to figure this place out because it was worth figuring out. It's been a great challenge. If making great Pinot Noir was an easy task, I'd be bored and I'd have to go do something else. Go back to being a fly fishing guide or something. Yeah. There is another success here that 
I take some credit for. And that's not about Yamhill Valley Vineyards, but about a thing called the Steamboat Pinot Noir Conference. And that is an event that brings together Pinot Noir producers from all over the globe, literally all over the globe now, uh, to a wonderful lodge down on the North Umpqua River in, in southern Oregon. And in, at this event, these 70 winemakers taste blind one wine from each winery present over a three-day period. And then they uh, take them apart, literally in the most critical possible tastings, take them apart. And then the winemaker has to stand up and after he's been exposed or she's been exposed, the winemaker has to stand up and tell us what they were doing. And this uh, <clears throat> this conference, this seminar, whatever you want to call it, has, I believe, allowed New World, in particular, Pinot Noir makers, to learn faster than if we were just on our own, if we were not sharing information. The reason that it works, I believe, is because terroir is so terribly important to this variety. Maybe more than any other grape, it describes where it grows. If you put Cabernet or Merlot or Zinfandel in ten different sites, it will still scream Cabernet or Merlot or Zinfandel. You plant Pinot Noir in ten different sites, and it's like talking to ten different people. They may all be Pinot Noir, but they're nothing alike, they're often very little alike. Again, because it describes the place where it grows. So if I get the gold medal, or you get the gold medal, and I tell you exactly how I made it, and you tell me exactly how you made it, it wouldn't matter. Because uh -huh. if you don't have my grapes, you're not going to make my wine. And there's plenty of disagreement over this. And, in, here in Oregon, there are lots of people that believe that the winemaker is as important as the dirt. And I believe the winemaker is important. I think that they have an impact on the wine. But I think it starts with the dirt, and that that's the most important part of the whole thing. The whole terroir deal. All the rain that falls, all how you farm. I mean, I, I, my vision, version of terroir is broad scope, and that's everything that goes into that wine is part of it. So I'm part of it. How we farm is part of it. Soils run is a big part of it. But all of it is, in my mind, the terroir. And since nobody else has this place, nobody else is going to make exactly these wines. But that conference, which is now, this will be its 29th year, uh, has short-circuited the learning curve for New World, in particular Pinot Noir producers. And we've now had um, Pinot Noir makers from, I think, 14 nations attend. Wow. And that includes those hotbeds of Pinot Noir like Japan and Israel. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how, that's how passionate this grape can make people. That's how addicted you get to Pinot Noir. You, you fall in love with it, you get addicted to it, and then you turn around and look in your own backyard and say, well, you know, I can't own Burgundy, so what am I going to do? And people are trying all over the globe now to make great wine out of this grape. Some with greater success than others, but it's still that same passion and desire to make great wine out of this grape. You get people in, in um, Argentina who are attempting to trade uh, lat altitude for latitude. They, we're on the 45th parallel here. That's relatively important. That's somewhat important in terms of telling you that you're in a cool climate. And we can't take, take that with too much. You have to take that with a, a bit of salt because if you follow the 45th parallel, parallel around the globe, you end up in the Gobi Desert. Is not planting much Pinot Noir, although who knows what the Chinese are doing now or where they are doing it. But uh, they don't have suitable areas of the 45th parallel in Argentina, so 
in a place that's probably about the equivalent of San Diego, uh, they're going up to 4,000 feet. And the same is being tried at the Golan Heights in Israel. That's amazing. Yeah, and pretty, de pretty decent wine. Uh, and it, it's Pinot. It's Pinot. Wow. I mean, they're planting other varieties, too. Yeah. You know, certainly not putting all their eggs in the Pinot Noir basket, but they're, you know, they're building a business out of Sauvignon Blanc, and you, you can only drink Sauvignon Blanc so long before you go insane. You've got to have red wine eventually, and then eventually you have to have Pinot Noir. So, uh, so the people come to this event, and they sit down, and the guy next to you might be a famous Oregon producer, or a Californian, or he might be a Burgundian, or somebody from Germany, or... Who knows? Many New Zealanders and Australians have been here. And now that that event has sparked knockoffs. And there is a what started out as virtually identical conference in New Zealand every year called the Southern Pinot Noir Workshop. There are two in Australia, one in Tasmania and one on Mornington Peninsula. There's a one-day event in California, down the south coast, every year uh, that, again, is for makers only and tasting and comparing their wines and telling each other their secrets. It was one on the east coast for a while. So there's been one in Chile, too. And this doesn't happen with any other variety. People don't get together and share their secrets. Cabernet, Napa Cabernet guys are not going to do this. They're not going to tell them what their leg up is. It's not going to happen. And the first time, the first year that we had Burgundians here was uh, Bob Druin. Robert Druin was there. And after the first session, he turned to David Adelsheim and said, we could never do this in Burgundy. Huh. Now, since that time, and that was many years ago, I've had Burgundians who have come to Steamboat and said, Stephen, I think it's time we do this in Burgundy. Or we do one of these for Burgundians. So even their world is being expanded. And has to. Where, where did this idea come from? Mm. <laughs> it came from a guy named Jim Morse. Excuse me, Jim Olson, who was... Oh. You, remember, you know Jim Olson? Uh, I don't know him. I've just come across his name, and I can't even remember why. Um, Jim was the uh, son-in-law of the owner of J.W. Morris Winery. Oh, okay in uh, the Bay Area, and he was the winemaker. And he was a real um, innovative and uh, smart guy. And he was, Henny Hinsdale, the distribution company that I worked for here, represented uh, J.W. Morris in Oregon. Uh -huh. We sold their wines up here. And Jim, and, is, Jim and Mike Richmond, who was at uh, Fremark Abbey at the time, they made the first J.W. Morris port in Mike's bathtub in Rutherford. <laughs> and so J.W. went on to establish a business in port. They were starting about the same time as Quadri or whatever that name is. Quadi. Quadi was establishing a port business down in like Fresno or someplace. Uh -huh. and, and Jim was making these ports from Sonoma fruit, Napa Sonoma fruit. And he also made Pinot Noir, uh -huh. and he he was a wine lover, and he had an extensive European background, so he knew French wines, and he knew Burgundy. And he, um, he came to Oregon, and he stayed with me at my house in Salem at the time. And I said, well, Jim, I'll invite some friends over, we'll have dinner. He said, great. So a couple of guys came over, a guy named... Del Pearl, who was, uh, he and his wife owned the Excelsior Cafe in, in Eugene, which was this wonderful restaurant, and he was the chef. And then a guy named Rick Denton, who was uh, the guy who took my place as the sommelier at Sun River, and Jim, and myself. And we sat around having dinner and drinking Burgundy. And I remember, and I don't have this kind of memory about anything else anymore, but we had a 1966 Pierre Ponel Montedy, and then we had a 1972 Latache, and a 1972 um, Vieille Vigne from Moussigny, from Comte de Vaudois. Uh -huh. 
And those three wines got us to about, I don't know, probably one o'clock in the morning. And by now, maybe we'd had a bit of sauterne or a bit of port. But Jim said, you know, we ought to have a meeting where California and Oregon Pinot Noir makers get together and talk about making Pinot Noir. And it struck a chord. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. I actually, I've got a history of Steamboat Conference. I'll print it out for you. I appreciate that. The other thing, too, is, um, um, I, I forgot to bring them in, is um, Sue Horstman uh, gave me a Oh, she gave you the yeah, photos? Yeah, I have the photos. Oh, terrific. And what I'd like to do, actually, is, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking for some historical type of photos to include, too, and I was wondering if, if you had some that, uh, that I could borrow or... Well, you can go th certainly go through any of that. Okay. Um, it's taken me five years to get it back from them, so it's not <laughs> six months. That's a little sore point. Uh -oh, the, uh -oh. they, uh, they put together a video, and in the video, you know, great homage was paid to David Lett and Dick Ponzi and all these other guys. And the only photo of me is with a silly hat on my head at Steamboat, looking like an idiot. So I thought they could do better than making me the class clown. They all thought that you know, that was who I am, I guess. So. Well, if it makes any difference, like Sue, when I asked Sue like who I should talk with, is like your name came up really early in the list. Oh, thank you. Uh, and that was uh, oh months and months and months ago. So. Well, I think Sue does a great job. This is no comment on anything other than that one incident. Yeah. All right, where are you? Come on. So, it, I mean, the, the deal was we were going to have this, we said, yeah, that's a great idea. So uh -huh. we'll have it, one year we'll do it in Oregon, and one year we'll do it in California. Uh -huh. And I knew about this place, Steamboat Inn, because I grew up on the Umpqua River, and it's a wonderful fishing lodge, and it was uh -huh. one of my fishing haunts. So I said, well, I know a place that would people would feel safe, away from the press kind of thing. Yeah. At, or they would just be inclined to be very open. So, let's go there. So we went there, we had a great time. And the next year we went to California. And we went to Mike Richmond's house in Carneros and had this great tasting. And then about uh, four o'clock, uh, you know, we're done with the tasting. All the Californians got up and drove home because they lived right there. Yeah. So we said, well, so now Mike has to put up with 13 Oregon Pinot Noir <laughs> makers <laughs> camping in his front lawn, and he's the only one. He has to drink Oregon Pinot Noir all night. So we came, then we came back to Steamboat and had another great time. And then we were gonna, now we're going to go back to California, but this year we're going to go to the Awani, Awani Hotel up in Yosemite, and you know that'll be a way too. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, dear Jim, who uh, is just a wonderful guy, as scatterbrained as it possibly could be, and it's just completely just unorganized. So a week before we're supposed to be there, he says, oh, I forgot to book the hotel. <laughs> so, <My Jim. laughs> so that year we did one day at Mike's house and one day at Jim's house in, in Albany, in New York, or Albany, uh, California, California. Yeah, Auburn or yeah, Albany. Well, there's an Albany in there. Uh, that's in the Bay Area. And Auburn Albany. is up in Sacramento. Yeah, yeah, Albany. His house was in Albany. So, and again, the Californians all drove home. So, we said, well, look, and so it's, it's going to be a steamboat from now on. Uh -huh. And that's that's what happened. Yeah. And it's been my pleasure to, you know, continue to direct the thing or be sort of a manager, coordinator, whatever. Um, I had a lot of help in, in the start, and guys like Myron and uh, Mike Richmond and lots of other folks who you'll see in the history here. But ultimately, I just took over the job of managing it uh -huh. and it has allowed me to go every year. Uh 
-huh. It's a lottery. I mean, there's, there's so oh, much, well, I was going to ask you, like, how people are chosen. Yeah, it's, there's so much demand that if you're from the North, North American continent, you have to go through a lottery to get there. Uh -huh. if, you're, if you're from overseas and you've been invited to IPNC, I'll give you an invitation uh -huh. automatically. Yeah. But if you're from, from anywhere in Canada and U.S., then you have to go through the lottery to get in. Yeah. And we don't want to move because the facility, the whole ambiance, everything is perfect about the place. And the room where we taste is small enough that you don't have to use a microphone. Uh -huh. And it's, it's a really important deal. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And it's, it's isolated enough. Um, it's isolated enough. And um, when we started, we encouraged some members of the press to come because we figured that Pinot Noir needed all the help it could get. Uh -huh. And after about 10 years, we had a discussion. We said, you know, we're speaking so frankly here about things that aren't necessarily legal with our antiquated laws that some young, young upstart journalists could make a name for themselves and cause us a whole lot of trouble, the whole industry a whole lot of trouble. So let's not take the chance. Yeah. And since then, we've not had press, yeah. not had media there. And so you're still the, um, the director then of, uh, I am. of uh, the steamboat? Yeah. The captain of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the guy that, get, that, that people can complain to. Uh -huh. I actually have a, a young lady helping me now. She's taking over vast majority of the administrative, almost all the administrative stuff. Who, who's that? Jenny Berg. Uh -huh. She's a, from here in McMinnville. Uh -huh. and she has an interest in Pinot Noir and she loves Steamboat. So uh -huh. she's she's a worked for a while as a, a seller rat and seller master, and, and now she's a librarian. But uh -huh. she hasn't. She maintains an interest. Yeah. You've talked, you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm kind of curious about if the Oregon wine culture is, what are the similarities and differences with other areas, Burgundy, California, New Zealand, Australia, and I'm talking about like the winemakers, you know, the people that are in the industry, not the, 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 the buyers, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm, I'm trying to, figure out like what makes the Oregon wine culture different, if it is in fact different. It, it, it's different, it's probably less different today than it used to be. And that's because we're maturing and we're attracting lots more people into the industry. Growers, wineries, every all aspects of the industry are growing here. And it is maturing. But when it started, you didn't have any money. And maybe the big difference between, say, here and Napa is that this place started with nothing. People were literally operating on shoestrings. And the only reason they, they could even get started here was because land was so cheap. It's the right place for Pinot Noir, don't get me wrong. It's not like, well, they couldn't buy a Napa, so they came here. It, this is the right place. But uh, it was also very inexpensive. And that allowed people with passion but no money to get started. It also forced a number of issues. One was, I can't afford to buy a new de-stemmer. Can I borrow yours? Well, sure. You're a member of the community. And if we don't band together, we're going to die. And we, we literally have felt throughout the first 25, 30 years of this industry that if we didn't act as one, then we would just be eliminated by California or who who knows. Act as one in terms of like sharing equipment? Or sharing sales equipment or, and, and or making joint efforts and marketing, uh, putting on a, a solid front, sort of patting each other on the back and not cutting each other down. Uh -huh. um, so there, there was a lot of understanding that we were, we had to do that in, in order to get, in order to make it, in order to succeed. And I don't think every place starts with that same feeling. Uh, certainly, um, 
New Zealand has largely done the same thing, but New Zealand also quickly broke into various regions, and those regions seemingly have become more important than the country as a whole. Uh, Martinboro feels in competition with Central Otago, and maybe Wipera feels in competition with Nelson, and so you've got five producing Pinot you Noir regions there, and I think they looked at their regions first, whereas here we were all in basically the same area. Let's say the central to northern Willamette Valley was it for Pinot Noir, so we were one place, and most of them were right here within Yamhill County, so it was easy to think of us, ourselves as of one place. Yeah and not nitpick with a guy from 10 miles away. Yeah. Now that requires a, a certain kind of a personality too. Is um, I mean early on there are some personalities that you know were a little bit caustic and um, you know so uh, like that cooperation. Well those uh, those personalities that that you refer to as caustic probably if you were here then, you would have seen that they weren't caustic to each other. Oh, okay. I mean, there may be people who are willing to tell the press to go jump in a, or that they were wrong, or a consumer, or a writer that they were wrong. Uh huh. But they tended to be very m m open with each other and uh, caring. Uh huh. Um, that has that has changed to some degree. There, there's more competition, and there's more. Now you'll hear maybe a bit more of. Oh no, he, those wines aren't as good as mine. But back then, there was a lot of patting each other on the back, saying, "Yeah, he makes good wine. She makes good wine. You know, we're all making good wine here." Yeah. Um, and those caustic personalities are um, were very helpful to each other, uh -huh. in my experience. I mean, I wasn't, I was in the game since '75 here, selling wines, but not making it. But all I saw was a whole lot of uh, camaraderie and, and uh, yeah, real sharing. Uh -huh. Now, as the state has grown, we get a little less sharing. Um, some newcomers have not been particularly good neighbors. They've not, they've not said the right things, and the right thing to say is, I'm very happy that we can come now and and learn from the people who have already been here, and and I thank them for sharing their information as opposed to coming and saying, "Well, we're about to, you know, we're about to redo all of Oregon." It's it's real nice you hillbillies got started here, but uh, you know now we're going to show you how it really should be done. And there aren't very many of those, mm -hmm. and it's still the vast majority are people that are. Uh, they're very happy to be here and very happy uh, with the help that they've gotten from the people who are here. Uh, I, perhaps, you know, one of the best examples are the Druans. They, they had all the experience in the world. I mean, they come from 125, 140 years of experience in Burgundy, and all they've ever done is uh, say nice things about Oregon and the people who are here. And all they've ever been is a terrific neighbor. Yeah. So, they they did it right. Some other newcomers have not. Some of them have been foolish. And um, egotistically foolish and probably don't even realize the debt they owe to the people who, who started it all. And they do owe. People went through the painful process. Of discovering the place. I mean, of finding it yeah. and hacking it out and making it famous before they ever made their first one. There's a wonderful... Uh, description of this, and it says, um, and I'm paraphrasing, uh -huh. those who come now will benefit from the years of experience of those who have come before them and learned how to grow grapes in this place. And they will benefit greatly in not having to make the same mistakes. It was written in 1902. Huh. Here in Oregon? Here in Oregon. So that was... Um, Grapes were planted around Oregon City in about 1870. Oh, 
Well, there's actually quite a, from my little research, there's quite a few places. Um, there's like David Hill. Yeah, and David Seth Hill and, um, and Oregon City were about the same time. Um, well, French, French Prairie. Do you know what French Prairie is about? No. French Prairie is due east of here, uh -huh. uh, north of Salem, but pretty much just due east of here, close to the, on the other side of the river. When the voyageurs, voyageurs, the mountain men, got as far as the Pacific coast, they ran out of country. They ran out of beaver pelts. So they quit trapping and started farming. Uh -huh. And those old guys, they were French Canadians. And they went to that place and started hacking out homesteads. And that's why it's called French Prairie. And those guys never got very far from alcohol. Uh -huh. There were grapes planted there in 1823, 40 years before the Oregon Trail started. Is that where... And, 20 well, years before. Um, I was talking with a guy at um, Fort Vancouver. Yeah, McLaughlin. And, and, and he was saying that there was a lot of vines that as people left that fort, people would take vines with them. And, um, and they, there was no record of any of this. That um, you know, they would plant them in various areas. Well, those are the guys that worked for John McLaughlin, Hudson's Bay Company was, mm -hmm. buy, was buying their pelts. Yeah. And when those guys got old enough, they didn't want to trap anymore. Or when they got, when they ran out of pelts, huh. they became. And exactly how uh, vines got here is very shrouded. There is a story about a English sailor stuffing seeds in his boots uh, <laughs> to come to the, the Oregon coast and to the Astoria, that sort of thing. Um, uh -huh. Who knows? But um, the, mission, the mission grape was in California at this time. The basis of, the, uh, of mission wine was already in California, so it would have been relatively easy for it to get up here. Yeah. And certainly those those very early plantings were not <laughs> premium Pinot Noir. But there is a very interesting note. In the seven, 1870s and 80s, when a vine industry was developing here, there were two camps. One was American varieties because they're very hardy, thick skinned, and they would travel well. And that and the, was the market was Chicago and New York, and they had to get on a railroad car and go all that way. So, guys like Llewellyn were encouraging uh, farmers to plant American varieties, Concords and what have you, Niagara's, etc because they would travel well. And these were going to be table grapes. At the same time, there was a smaller voice, and that was, this is a great place for uh, premium uh, Vitis vinifera, European varieties. This is a great place to grow cool climate, make cool climate wines. And that's David Hill in particular. Uh -huh. uh, that guy made uh, gold medal winning Rieslings in 1898 and 1902 in, their, in the expositions in St. Louis. So he was at, advocating premium wines. And the notes of the Oregon Horticultural Society reflect both arguments. Huh. From the annual meetings, we'd have these conversations. And, and so they eventually came up with lists of varieties that they would suggest growing. And interestingly enough, in those lists, under what looks to be under European varieties, were, was something called Burgundy and something else called Red Burgundy. Wow. Huh. So David Letts planting here, and Richard Summers before him, by the way, uh, planting may not have been the first Pinot Noirs in Oregon. Huh. In fact, in my mind, likely we're not. 
Not that it makes a hill of beans. Yeah. You know, it's long yeah. since that's dead history. But yeah. but it's possible that people recognized as far back then that this is the right place to grow Pinot Noir. Period. Huh. <laughs> that's that's interesting. That's the first I've heard. Um, you know, like yeah, real it's, definitive. Yeah, it's pretty uh, cool stuff actually. Kind of things yeah. and um, the things that I heard about. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Reuter or Reuter or... Reuter's Hill. Um, up there. That's That was the guy that made those the award-winning wines. Yeah. Yeah. I keep hearing the word purported uh, gold gold medals and stuff like that. Ooh, um, I'm not sure if I could put my finger on the, where I've read it. It's written in a, quite a few, you know, like oh, yeah, historical yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah, books. Yeah, no, it is, but it also could come from one comment, you know, sort of like Mohammed saying you shouldn't drink wine. Yeah, yeah. Even though he continued to drink wine all the rest of his life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think I've seen it noted um, where it would be legitimate. Uh -huh. Where it would be. The Wines of America is... Uh, a reference that is worth having a look at. That's an academic tome from oh, a guy, I think he was at the University of Pennsylvania, who wrote that. Probably in the 70s. When you look back on your really varied kind of being in various parts of... Uh, Checkered, perhaps, <laughs> fast. <laughs> Checkered, I mean, that's, like, I find it really fascinating. I mean, you've seen, like, all aspects, and especially when you start out selling the stuff. I mean, that, that's that got to be tough. Really, really tough. Well, it was, there was a whole lot of rejection not and a bad. whole lot of not sales. The first, <laughs> that just reminded me, the first time I went east, <clears throat> I have a younger brother who was a fireman EMT at the time. Here in Oregon? Uh, yes. And he was going back east to Beltsville, Maryland, where the National Fire Academy is, uh -huh. to do a special firefighting course of some kind. And he had a pickup truck. He had a Toyota pickup truck with a, with a cab on the back. And I put 30 cases of samples in the back of that truck, <laughs> and we drove across the country oh. in the middle of winter. Wow. Middle of winter. Two broke to, we, we stayed in a motel in Winnemucca one night. We slept in the car the next night in uh, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and swam in the hot springs there to stay warm. <laughs> slept in the car. Um, and eventually I dropped him in Maryland so he could go to school uh -huh. and I went on to New York to find a distributor for these Oregon wines and I talked to a bunch of distributors big and small and they all just said get out of here I don't even want to taste them didn't really? even want to taste them didn't, to... nah. didn't even want to taste them can't sell Pinot Noir can't sell Riesling what the hell are you doing here? So it was the varietal not just being Oregon. Oh, it was everything. I mean, everything was wrong about it. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I finally heard about this one place called uh, Winebow. 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 And it was this new, small distribution company that it was just getting started. And it had been founded by a couple of guys named Peter Matt and Leonardo Locascio. And... So I went to see them, and uh, I met with Peter, and I told him what I was doing, and would he be interested in selling these Oregon wines? And he said, no. Nah. <laughs> they were primarily uh, selling Italian wines. Leonardo is Italian, and Peter is married to an Italian, and they had great love of Italian wines, and they were, they were basically starting a business with Italian wines, but they also had some Burgundies from Bob Haas, and so they had some interest in Pinot Noir, and they were looking to sell to for anything they could sell. It was a startup company. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you know, you want to try it? They said, no. So I finally, in frustration, said, look, if I go out this week in Manhattan and I call on or accounts, if I go see retailers, and I get orders for these wines, 
will you bring them in and take the distributor markup? And Peter said, well, I, I guess I could do that. <laughs> And I came back on Friday with orders for two pallets. Wow. That was three days later, four days later. And we've been in business ever since. Wow. Peter Matt is divorced from Leonardo. They are no longer partners at Winebow, but Winebow's gone on to become uh, a very large wine di distribution company that still sells some Oregon wine. And Peter has uh, since started his own business, which is selling one Oregon wine. Yam Hill Valley Vineyards, very successfully. Uh -huh. But that's that was the kind of stuff that I that I ran into back in those days. It was just we don't need this. Yeah. We don't. And they're expensive. We don't need this. And it was expensive. Well, it wasn't expensive, but it was you know it was still two tons to the acre, and you just can't make Pinot Noir cheap. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Not decent Pinot Noir. You get two tons the acre, you're not going to compete with something that's grown at five or six, yeah. which is what Napa does in Cabernet. Good Cabernet can grow at those levels. Yeah. So. So and and, and that was sort of indicative of the kind of startup experiences I had. Yeah. But I was young and. Um, and determined. I wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah. I knew these wines were too good and. So we just kept fighting with it, and eventually it worked out. In, in, you know, looking back, and now, like, you're spending quite a bit of time in the vineyard. I'm not a bit of culturist, but I spend more time in the vineyard all the time. Just listening, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, what has the vineyard taught you personally about life? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, well, I, I find that... that being a farmer or being a, a what I call a value-added farmer, we we are agriculturalists. The difference is at the end of the season, we don't load it in the truck and send it down the road to the packing plant. We then get to turn it into wine. So we're value-added farmers. It's I think that farming is... Absolutely, a great way to keep your feet on the ground. I mean, How so? What, what does that mean? Well, it just makes you—it makes you understand the cycles of the seasons. It makes you understand maybe the nature of life. It's things grow; they go through their time. They pass along their children, and then they die. Uh -huh. It starts all over again the next, you know, a few months later. So it's. I don't know, I just find a whole lot of um, the hustle and bustle that, that many, many human beings go through to be sort of self-inflicted and unimportant. It doesn't, it doesn't strike me as either necessary nor valuable. I find growing grapes and making wine to be a good thing, uh -huh. and that it's the right thing for me. It's good for your spirit. It's good for my spirit. It's very good for my spirit. Yeah, it's a lot of hard work, and it's also very rewarding. Yeah. There's nothing like having a, a bottle of your own wine on the table. I bet. <laughs> very, very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you like it. Well, it helps. <laughs> and, you, and if you're making wine and you don't like it, you probably got to <laughs> do something else or somewhere else. Yeah.